every once in a while I stumble upon a company that does something extraordinary and I think Lululemon fits in this category as even though it was quite a small company a decade ago, it is outsmarting giants like Nike and Adidas. Of course, if you take a look at the share price, probably the most of the attention goes into this decline of almost 50% over the last eight months or so. So how is this company outsmarting Nike and Adidas? Well, let's have a look at a few data points first. The annual revenue growth over the last decade has been 21% compared to 6% and 3% for Nike and Adidas respectively. And if you take a look at Lululemon's revenue, now it is, well, a bit over 40% of the revenue of Adidas and close to 20% of the revenue of Nike. So this is just a simple comparison in terms of size. But here's what I find extraordinary. Despite growing at a fast pace, Lululemon has significantly higher operating margins. And you might wonder, well, how, how is this possible? After all, this is an apparel company. What is the secret? And I would say the secret is ignoring the rules. See, every company in this industry does the same thing. They sign big name celebrities to endorse their products, to promote their products. Nike has Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods and Nadal. Adidas has Messi and Beckham and Harden. Under Armour has Dwayne Johnson, Tom Brady and Steph Curry. And Lululemon has nobody. And this is something that is working perfectly because they had a bit of a different model. And I, I, in hindsight, it's obvious that it works. But I think it's more, more difficult to connect with these celebrities. Of course, you can admire them, but you're not going to interact much with them. So they decided to go with so-called brand ambassadors. Micro-influencers, yoga teachers, fitness instructors. They are the ones that are going to promote the brand. And instead of paying them in cash, well, they're going to give them free apparel. They're going to give them priority access to new products. And they will be featured on company social media and websites. So these brand ambassadors get to host Lululemon events, and basically create a lot of small communities all over the world. That seems to be working. The outcome, well, Lululemon spends a lot less on marketing compared to Nike and Adidas. So as we will see later, that will translate into higher gross margins. Now, of course, their products are quite more expensive than the competition, right? And, and there, is, there is some competition. Initially, they capitalized on athleisure, so kind of a, a different type of clothing, a bit more athletic, stylish, and well, more everyday use as well. They have great quality. There's no doubt about that. The, the customers are happy with the quality, and they offer free hemming with a Lululemon membership. So if uh, whatever is being bought is a bit too long, well, they'll take care of it. The competitors, Hello Yoga and Vori, and there are a lot of copycats out there um, that cause concern to some investors. Uh, but I would like to maybe take a bit of a different angle here. Take a look at the very expensive products out there, you know, the, the big brands. They always have cheaper alternatives. There is always copycats, or products that look the same, but are much cheaper or, or similar at least. But history has taught us that there will always be demand for premium brands, especially in the fashion industry. It's a bit of a status that some people crave. They, they like to wear certain brands and to me, it seems that Lululemon starts to fall into this category. And if, especially if we take a look at the, let's say, the sentiment across different ages, it is growing over time. So about 55%, uh, about 55 years, only 11% find Lululemon favorable. Now it's 24% for the younger generation. And if there is a trend here, then this is only going to um, help Lululemon grow, grow in the long run. And I do think it will grow... Uh, not only because the, of the demographics, right? There will be more younger people joining the uh, or increasing the, uh, the demand for products of this kind that obviously are uh, favoring Lululemon. 80% of the revenue comes from the Americas, so there's a lot of room to expand outside of the US. Um, and I mean, it's not that difficult to, uh, to upsell, to come up with new products. After all, it's an apparel company, so... As long as they invest in research and development to come up with new uh, new products, then I would not be surprised if they continue to grow for decades uh, to come. Now, if you take a look at the historical financial performance, they have exceptional margins, both gross margin and the operating margin we already saw. Um, and there, there, are two, there are two factors, the advertising, the marketing part that we already covered, 
And the second part is selling direct to consumers. Over 90% of their sales are online or through their own company operated stores. So there is no third party in between to take a cut. It's just Lululemon selling to their customers. The outcome is quite clear. Compared to Nike and Adidas, they have significantly higher gross margin. So higher gross margin and lower marketing expenses. Combining that, well, they get to a significantly higher operating margin than its competitors. And I'm surprised that a lot of other um, companies do not follow a model of this kind. Uh, by that, I mean to partner a lot more with local um, you know, fitness studios, maybe, or coaches or yoga instructors and compensate them in, in uh, free apparel or, or, or maybe a discount of some sort. So where does this cash go? Because after all, if we take a look at, um, at this slide, I mean, the company is profitable, so they need to do something with it. Of course, one part goes into reinvestment. They have, have increased the number of stores significantly and will continue to do so, given that they're not at a significant number yet. It's below 800 stores, so there's a lot of room to grow. And then the second part is buying back shares. So they have been buying back shares. And this leads to what I consider one of the two mistakes. The share price has been significantly higher than it is now. And the management has been buying shares at, at all times. And um, in theory, of course, there is, a, um, there is a threshold above which you are destroying shareholders' value by buying back shares. And I do think that that threshold has been passed on multiple occasions. So... The, the fact that they're buying back shares doesn't mean that they're, they have been creating value for the shareholders. And then the second mistake is the one mentioned below. Lululemon Atletica acquired a home fitness innovator. Well, that was at least a description. Mirror back in June of 2020. Not that long after that, it was impaired as, of course, the, the COVID-19 was not here, luckily, for a long time. Um, and, well, they overpaid uh, for, for this acquisition. So... As mentioned many times before, the, the quickest way to destroy value is to um, acquire a company and overpay for it. And this has been the case. So luckily, Lululemon does not acquire companies often. So this is fairly limited risk, but still it is a mistake that the management made in the past. Now, if I take a look at my DCF model, I have a few, a few um, variables, right? The revenue growth rate. I do think that there is still quite a uh, runway for them to grow. There's quite some room to grow, but I'm not going to use a double digit number yet. I don't, I don't think that's that fits within my expectation. It's, this seems more, more reasonable. And the operating margin, even though they can still grow, uh, I'll, I'll keep it at 22%. Um, I think that's, again, it's still above the competition and I'm not factoring in any decrease of margins due to copycats or, or competitors. I do think that they have some brand power here and they're able to charge premium prices i could be wrong but that is at least my uh, my assumption here so i'm being a bit more conservative maybe on the revenue side but i keep the margin as as is and the outcome is about 270 dollars a share which is not that far from the current price of 259 but let's not forget the price today is about 50 percent lower than the all-time high so it used to be significantly overvalued than uh, than it is now now, you might have different assumptions than mine. You might expect that uh, the company grows faster or maybe the margin increases over time. And this matrix would help you see where the devaluation per share falls in. So what I have is basically doubling the revenue over the next decade with a 22% margin. That's a 269. Um, again, it seems to me that if the company... Uh, goes down to let's say 200 220 then the uh, expectations by the market is well fairly low um, and only then i would be interested in in opening a position so a disclosure i don't have any shares of lululemon uh, i have never had uh, i didn't short the company after all this is the first time that i really had a, a deep look into the company's financials but also more importantly the the fundamentals of the company what it does how it makes money and again I do think that this is a great case that should be covered in business schools. Hope that you enjoyed this video and as always, see you in the next one.